So yeah, welcome to Flora Funga Podcast. Um, I am happy to have you. And, and we I'm have... happy to be here. We have Lily coming in. Hello. I'm sorry, I'm so late. No, you are perfectly fine. Everything is going great. We just started. Um, I guess I just kind of wanted to get to know both of you, your names, uh, how you got into like in kind of your background on stuff like that. Well, Lily, she was kind of forced into getting into life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say forced, encouraged Encour strongly. <laughs> encouraged. So, so I've been doing this probably since, um, I don't know, like 2004, I think. And when I was a student, I loved hiking. I, I've always loved hiking. And I would see these lichens growing all over the place. And um, somebody told me at one point, hey, they're teaching a course on lichenology. Uh, you should totally take it and I took it and it was so cool and I thought man this is the perfect opportunity to get out and explore and hike around and see things that I've never even thought about right right um, so that was a blast and I've been doing it ever since then um and along the way you know I try to like lasso people and say <laughs> it's really cool and sometimes it sticks and sometimes they run far yep. away <laughs> yep. for me it's stuck obviously. okay so that's how it worked with you yeah yeah I got lassoed in by Stephen to do some like kind of graphic design -y work okay um about lichens in kind of just the Utah area um yeah. and then eventually that morphed into an Instagram account <laughs> so I I run the Instagram now so I had seen some of Lily's art and mm -hmm. like you know, some of her drawing. Anyway, she has like this really cool way of depicting stuff. And I thought, man, I'm a scientist. I'm not an artist. And I want to figure out better ways of making or helping people appreciate right. how cool lichens are. And I yes. can, I can, I can start talking about the, the nitty gritty details that are interesting to like five people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I had seen what Lily had done before. And I'm like, Lily, you're an awesome artist. You're a great communicator. Please help me out with like <laughs> communicating what we do to a broader audience than like the scientists that are interested in this. Yeah, that's definitely kind of why I have this podcast because I'm trying to, at first I was like, oh, I just want to make it kind of like how I want to listen. Like I love plant physiology and um, ecology, but I feel like not a lot of people are on that level and trying to get multiple avenues to just appreciate nature is kind of what it's more about getting everyone involved. And sometimes as scientists, I think we really do a disservice by, by the way we communicate and we make it pretty inaccessible, yeah. um, intentionally, of course. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Lily's been great at figuring out how to translate our, our, uh, <laughs> our research to a broader audience. That's yeah, awesome. I'm really going to say that doesn't make any sense. You need to say that differently. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask. I, I don't even know what that word means and you've used it like four times in this conversation. Please explain it. Yeah, that sounds about that sounds about science. Um, so where where are you two at right now and what kind of um, research are you involved with? Yeah, so from the research end, um, I come at this from like a, an evolutionary perspective, um, especially thinking about how does evolution occur in symbiotic systems. When we think about evolution, we can think about like selection on a specific organism, um, whether they're Darwin's finches or the domestication of corn um, or, or artificial selection of pigeons or whatever. Hmm. But what happens when the unit of selection is a whole bunch of organisms together in a symbiotic system? And maybe this is a time like where we try to define what a lichen is. Yeah, that's perfect. So. so so lichens are weird. You look at it and, and they come up and they assemble into these things that you can identify one specific lichen and it always assembles in one form and you get the same ingredient and it assembles in that same form in another place. So we look at it and we think of them as an organism, mm. but they're not organisms, right? It's this idea of what I call a symbiotic phenotype where you have um, some main fungal host or partner that's associating with a photosynthetic organism, that's associating with a whole bunch of other bacteria, um, and then a whole bunch of other fungi, and they all kind of come together and assemble and have this emergent property where the lichen itself looks nothing like any of the mm. individual components. Gotcha. 
Got um, it. So it's already getting nasty and messy, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> to find what this is. Um, but the lichen you can think about as a, a main fungal partner with some photosynthesizing organism, whether it's a green alga or a cyanobacterium, mm -hmm. and then a whole suite of other microbes that are co-occurring and somehow they come together and they form, they consistently form lichens that look the same that we would call a lichen species. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so hard to it's messy pretty quick. So that's my, that's my interest is how does evolution happen in these systems where selection is happening mm. on a symbiotic phenotype and not necessarily on a single organism. Right. Wow. Yeah. That is like a lot to take in for the average person. And um, yeah. So what are, what, what is not a lichen then? Yeah, so what classifies so that? People will look and they'll be like, "Oh, it's like a moss, and it's and and, and it they, looks like a moss." Yeah, mm -hmm. so fair assumption. It's a fair assumption. They look like mosses, yeah. and they <laughs> occupy similar spaces, oftentimes mm -hmm. similar niches. Um, but it's not a moss. Um, it's not a mushroom. Um, in fact, a moss is more closely related to to a plant, mm -hmm. whereas the fungal partner in a lichen is more closely related to humans. Right. Right. So, right. Um, so spooky stuff. So it's, it's not a moss. <laughs> it's not a mushroom. Um, but they occupy similar habitats or similar. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And that... it's not a plant. Like it doesn't have leaves or flowers or roots. Like it's its own. Yeah. Yeah. It's like living on other things. Um, yeah. Does it ever come up from like the ground? Um, what are like the main habitats that it inhibited? So these lichens are everywhere right okay. they, yep. they, any terrestrial habitat whether it's soil they can occur on that they can occur on leaves especially in the subtropics and tropical areas um, often we see them growing on tree bark or branches mm -hmm. or rocks um, so usually it's any place that is stable enough that's that's not moving around long enough for these lichens to develop mm -hmm. okay but they're, yeah they're they're all over the place and you could go out and look in the park across the street or the parking strip in front of your apartment and you'll see like oh man there's lichens growing on the trees yeah yeah after learning about lichen I was like well they are on everything you just kind of have to like look around or um yeah like the different types which is really cool um so why why should people think that lichen are important like what are they Lily, let's I think <laughs> I think it's just important to recognize like the amazing diversity of the organisms and, and uh, symbiotic organisms mm -hmm. and just in the world and to have appreciation for like all these different like complexities and interesting I don't know types of plants and animals and lichens which are like not either of those things um, I think it just encourages people to like get out of nature and see things and also to feel more connected to the, mm -hmm. the planet, <laughs> um, yeah. which I mean, is very necessary since yeah. everything is yeah. global mm -hmm. all the time. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot easier to want to protect the planet when you are um, like, I don't know, invested in like yeah. different organisms on the planet yes i agree i think people are trying to get into that more it's like getting into nature and being one with the connection of it yeah and the great thing about lichens is like stephen was saying like you can just walk across the street or you can i don't know in my house i have a bunch of like stone and there are lichens like in mm. my house <laughs> yeah mostly dead um <laughs> <laughs> But like, it's really accessible no matter where you're living, you know, mm -hmm. if you're in an urban space or if you're in a very rural area, like they're going to occur in either of those. I love that perspective of like making the connection, um, you know, so if, 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 if we were studying, I don't know, um, um, eagles or polar bears, no one ever asks like, well, why do you study that? But if you study these things like that are a little more esoteric or harder to make a connection, People are like, well, what is the point of that? Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, maybe it's the connection. Maybe it's because, hey, there are questions uh, that we we don't know the answers to and we can ask and try to figure it out. And there's there's beauty and power to asking questions and trying to find um, 
you know, legitimate answers that support those, making connections. Um, like I said, these lichens are everywhere. And once you see them, I don't know if you've experienced this, but you can't unsee them everywhere. Yeah. You oh, there, oh, oh, there, oh, man, here's some more. Oh, yeah. But all of a sudden you start realizing that this world that we live in is not nearly as narrow as we saw it before, but it's much more broad. And, and there's mm-hmm. power to that. I think our research will never change the world in terms of, of you know, uh, I don't know, coming up with, with a cure for cancer or um, even solving the biodiversity crisis, mm-hmm. extinction crisis, but it does broaden our perspective in some pretty powerful ways. Yeah, I do like that. And how, how many species do you think there is, if you can even like yeah. classify that? So with a colleague in Germany, we've actually gone through and we've tabulated this. And currently there's about 20,000 described species. Wow. And it sounds like a lot and it feels like a lot when we try to understand all of these mm-hmm. things relative to insects. Um, there are orders of magnitude more insect species than there are lichen forming fungal species. And the 20,000 species of lichen forming fungi. So this is where it gets weird, right? There's okay. There's no such thing as a lichen species. Right. It's like com- combinations of different yeah. stuff. And that's, an, that's a nasty way to think about things. You're like, what? There's no lichen species. Um, but they're all just these, these symbiotic systems. With mm-hmm. these so there's 20,000 different species of lichen forming fungi. Okay. And that's probably a, a pretty significant underestimate. Um, I don't know if there's five times that many, um, 10 times that many, but it, it certainly is an underestimate. Mm. Well, and people are also describing new lichens all the time. It's just, I don't know. I The process for that doesn't seem super easy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, how does naming even work? Yeah, it's fun. I mean, so we, we're describing a, a few new species now, and you know what we're describing is the lichen forming fungal part of this. Okay based on the features largely of the symbiotic holobiont. Okay. Anyway, so, so it is fun and it's, it's, it's worthwhile to document and describe this broader range of diversity. But like Lily says, there's, there's I mean, unending work. There's not, enough, there's not enough time and not enough people to complete and document lichen diversity in any reasonable time frame. Mm. And what are some like characteristics that people can um, use to help ID these types of connections? Like, are there, what are some of the, the vocabulary for that? So this is really fun. And this is some of the stuff that Lily has been helping um, try to translate. But, but, but traditionally we use things like secondary metabolites. These lichens, they produce um, secondary compounds for anti herbivory to mm-hmm. discourage predators from munching on these little things. Some of the secondary metabolites are sunscreens to protect them from UV rays. Um, so sometimes we'll go through and we can extract those secondary metabolites and identify what those are. And those mm. can be pretty important characters for describing species. Some of the more traditional characters have been measuring spore sizes, right? So you, you have to become good at microscopy and you section these fruiting bodies on uh, the, or the, 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 the the, the um, structure on this lichen that's producing fungal spores, mm-hmm. uh, thin sections, and you can count spores, measure mm-hmm. spores. And those have been traditionally really good characters um, for describing or for taxonomic descriptions. Right. But it becomes more messy because now as we start sequencing these things, we realize like, oh, what we were calling like one species is actually comprised of 10 different things and oh, they all okay. produce the same secondary metabolites. Oh, they all wow. have more or less similar spore sizes. So what are we supposed to do? Um, so I've been using a lot of genomic information um, to inform taxonomic decisions, but that even makes it less accessible where people are like, all right, so what the heck is this? Do I have to sequence its genome to right. figure out right. what the fungal species is? Um, but currently um, we try to integrate DNA with morphology, with anatomical characters, with chemistry, with ecology, and hopefully put all that stuff together to come up with pretty robust, um, I call them hypotheses of what a species is. And you know, if somebody else comes along and says, oh man, Levitt was so far off, he should have looked at this. <laughs> what he's calling the species is, is totally not legit. Whatever, that's great. You know, Each species <laughs> should be treated as a falsifiable 
hypothesis. Mm, okay. Yeah. For the common people out there, <laughs> non like an elite, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I often describe like three, like kind of morphologies of mm -hmm. the lichens. There's crustose, which is kind of it looks crusty. That's right. how I always think about it. They often are on, like they're like connected very well to their substrate, whether mm -hmm. it's a rock or a tree or whatever. Like you have to, if you want to collect some of that, you have to take some of the substrate with you. Got and it. There's um, folios, which is kind of more. I don't know. I kind of want to. I always want to say leafy, but that just doesn't really capture everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more, it looks more like a plant. <laughs> it's like leafy or like stringy. Mm -hmm. um, and those generally have more like dimension off the surface of the substrate. And yeah, then, right. Okay. Um, lichens, which are more, I don't know, 3D, <laughs> their own thing. Um, um, I mean, they're connected to a substrate too, but it's, those are the kind that you could probably just like off rock um yeah so i i highly recommend googling the different kinds of like yeah oh look here's what this can look like you know or or what it can't but it, it's pretty cool because from an evolutionary perspective you know crustose lichens aren't a natural group mm -hmm. Fruticose lichens aren't a natural group folios lichens aren't a natural group and what that means is that you have the evolution of crustose forms that happens a whole bunch of times independently, or probably more likely the evolution of folios or fruticose forms multiple times independently. Wow, That's okay. Really wacky. Within one single family of lichen forming fungi, you can have crustose, folios, and fruticose lichens. And what that means is that you have the reinvention or the convergence on these different growth forms happening multiple times across um, mm. lichen forming fungi. Wow. So there's something really beneficial or some adaptive value to, to, to move towards a folios lichen in some situations or move towards a fruticose lichen in some mm. situations or maintain as a crestose, right? Lichen. Oh, so it's wow. a cool evolutionary perspective where, yeah, we call them these three main groups, but they happen, they occur a whole bunch of times independently. And it's all about that selective pressure where you're taking all these symbionts interacting together and somehow we get this consistent evolution towards these three major growth forms. Wow, wow. So they can kind of change based on the environment that they're around or are, is it more of like a set thing their whole life? Yeah, so it's more change in terms of evolutionary change, got right? It. So it's not plastic, they're not changing because, oh, this environment is, is this way, so I'm going to develop as a fruticose lichen, but it's more change through evolutionary. Mm, okay. That lineage will maintain that, but it, it will adapt to whatever those, those selective pressures are. Right, wow. Until it's fruticose. That's really neat. Um, what are some, uh, you were talking about the spore producing um, structures, what are those called? in lichen yeah or? so these, these are the same of most most lichen lichens um the main fungal partner is is an ascomycete okay uh, filamentous fungus so being an ascomycete they produce spores in little sacs um, and those spores are, are inside of the fruiting structures that are called um apothecia okay and those apothecia they look like discs sitting on top of the lichen thallus and within those discs they're producing these spores inside of sacs, like any other ascomycete, mm -hmm. um, including the non-lichen forming ascomycetes. Okay. So that's um, like morels and stuff like that. So things like morels, um, like the mushrooms that we see, those are mm -hmm. basidiomycetes, um, and they produce their spores on stalks in, in, in different ways. Cool. Right? Okay. So those are two different main lineages. Yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, of fungi. Um, and then, yeah, so some, I feel like I was reading in a book um, that they call them pixie cups. Is that the same as those little um, uh, apothecia? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so the, the pixie cups, these are part of the, the group, the cladonia, cladonias. Okay. The lichens, there's some that have pixie cups, they look like little trumpets. Mm -hmm. uh, 
have um, these stalks with these bright red fruiting bodies on them. But that's exactly right. These are the areas where they're producing spores. And that fungal spore has to shoot out, disperse, and then it has to associate with the right photosynthetic, the appropriate photosynthetic partner, um, and then the right, you know, whatever associated fungi and bacteria for it to actually form a brand new. Mm. Nice. And do they use water or is that more of like a uh, mechanical dispersion thing? Yeah, I think it's all kinds of stuff, right? It okay. could be birds, it could be snails, it could be like a raindrop that 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 um, cladonia and then it shoots off the spores from a raindrop. Okay, okay. But dispersal of spores, I think it, there are people that study that and it's a really cool question like how far can this teeny tiny microscopic spore mm -hmm. actually disperse and how does it actually get high enough to ultimately become airborne? And that's a huge, a huge trait or a huge challenge is just to get it high enough to break that 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 tension oh. to ultimately become airborne and disperse far enough to have any meaningful contribution to disperse. Right. Wow. That is something else. I like that. It's yeah, it's wacky. <laughs> Every, everywhere you look at with this stuff, like there are wacky things going on. Yeah. It's never like, wow, that's so expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, like in our just oh, like zone. <laughs> that's awesome. And uh what would you say is endangering lichen or what um are lichen fearing right now? People. <laughs> General. Yeah, it's 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 like um most organismal groups, right? It's it's uh, habitat destruction and climate change, mm. right? and those are the, the two main threats, um, probably for all, nearly all biodiversity. And it's the same thing for lichens. Um, an example here: we are working out of uh, in the state of Utah. Oh my gosh, I'm so um, sorry. And it's hot. It's dry. You know, we're in the middle of a, a, a pretty significant drought, and we have these beautiful soil crusts that are dominated in a lot of cases by lichens. Okay. Once these soil crust communities are disturbed, it takes decades to centuries for them to recover. Mm. And with changing climate and changing um, uh, precipitation regimes, the timing of precipitation, etc., these soil crusts may never actually recover. Oh wow. Um, and that's probably a similar threat to everything, right? Is is with with loss of habitat and then with changes in climate, those traditional um, niches or that time frame that was required for the establishment of these lichen communities is completely altered. And we'll get new communities, right? There will be changes, and they may be less diverse. They'll be shift. I mean, who knows what they'll look like exactly? Mm, okay. But they won't mirror what they've been over the past you know, 20,000 years since the last glacial maximum. Okay, so you'll hope that they kind of adapt and bounce back in their own way. <laughs> yeah, and I think they will. I mean, it may be less diverse, you know. Mm -hmm. People won't be around forever. Our impact won't be, be around forever. The life can be certain of us, um, but those communities that survive this, this sifting, um, they'll be changed because of human impact. Right. Communities will be completely different because of, of the decisions and our behavior. Does yeah, that make sense? That is sad. Yeah. Yeah, because is, isn't there like lichen in space now or uh, what's that whole? Yeah, yeah, they um, sent lichens up to the space station and just like had them in a box on the outside <laughs> of the space station is what it sounds like. And they like, I think 70% of them remained viable after they came to Earth. So oh, wow. coming back to Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's super interesting. Yeah. I mean, plants can't do that usually. Yeah. I don't think ever. Um, but so this is one of the yeah. strengths or one of the, I guess they're very hardy little things. Yeah. For arid adapted to arid adapted lichens, they're super hardy. And it's because they com almost completely shut down metabolically. Mm. Right? That's why you can take a lichen from an arid region or an Arctic region, put it in like space outside of, a, of the shuttle or wherever they take this, and it survives. It's because everything is shut down. And then oh. it's back to Earth and get some moisture, it can actually become metabolically active again. Oh, wow. So that makes them really, really tough. But the problem happens if you start getting like sporadic rain or weird temperatures, 
when those lichens turn on when they shouldn't turn on. Right. And then they die. So you're like, man, these things are so tough. And they are tough. Yeah. <laughs> if, if they're dry. Got um, it. Okay. If they shut down completely. But then with climate change, anyway. So that's where it gets tricky is they're tough as nails under the right condition. <laughs> right. So, oh man, what was I? Um, so how long can they survive without anything? Like, can they be shut down for a year or how long is that usually we, last? And we had a post on this. <laughs> Let me look. <laughs> so, so one post that we could do in the future is a good example, I think, it, are the lichens in the dry valleys of Antarctica. Mm -hmm. These things may grow, I don't know, a hundredth of a millimeter a year. That means that almost the entire year they're com almost completely metabolically inactive. Oh, okay. There's just maybe minutes during the year when there's enough precipitation, when the temperature is right, where they can actually grow. And there may okay. not, be, in some years, there may not be any time, like not even a single second where they're metabolically able to grow. Um, so you can have lichens, you know, that are, I don't know, the si diameter of a golf ball mm -hmm. that are 10,000 years old or more in Whoa. these dry valleys of, of Antarctica. That's crazy. Yes. And so how, do, how, hmm, which one is the one that grows the fastest if you could pick one? Yeah, which ones? So there are some, these are called the pelt or the dog lichens. And okay. you'll often find them on like road cuts. Um, maybe some of these, these cladonia lichens can grow pretty fast. Um, so not all lichens are slow growing. Mm -hmm. um, some of them can grow relatively fast. There are lichens um, that hang from trees in, in the Pacific Northwest of the United yeah. States. That's that so are funny. like, you know, two meters long. They're really, really big. So not all lichens are slow growers, but mm -hmm. things like the cladonias and the pelts that grow in disturbed sites, these things probably grow at pretty quick rates um, as they try to like pioneer these, these disturbed sites. Okay. And they're so slow because they turn on and off their um, metabolic. Yeah. So the stuff. slow growers are the ones that, that are often in really dry or really cold places where there's just no opportunity to grow, except for a few optimal times right after a rainfall event mm -hmm. uh, or something else. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, we have a like a Instagram TV video that kind of talks about that, about um, big tooth maple like in communities in the winter and how you would expect, you know, like, like, it's like grow so much in the summer, you know, but in the winter, that's when they get the water mm -hmm. in you. That's where they get the water. And when they have access to the sun, because all the trees have dropped their leaves and right. stuff. They're just, it's really fascinating. It's not like, I don't know. It's so cool. So this is like one of the beauties of trying to like, this is one of the reasons it's worth studying lichens is because any avenue you pick, it just opens up to a million other questions. It's like a Pandora's box in a really beautiful way where you're like, mm -hmm. oh, now I'm seeing like these interconnections in new ways that maybe I wouldn't have, have that wouldn't have been so, so um, intuitive, um, but allows us explore, exploratory perspective to understand like the complexities of life and those interactions at a scale that we typically don't think about. Right, no, that's why I was looking up certain Instagram posts and I, I love looking at lichen too and so that's why I stumbled across um, the account and also I was like oh I, I need some lichenist lichenologist on I need somebody that's into lichen or um, trying to show people what lichen is. <laughs> so this is I think this is I think one of the things that that we I, I really want to do and it's that idea of making those connections and making somebody see lichens. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not that they can go out and identify 50 species with a, with a guidebook or yeah. something. I don't think people are able to, well, they may be, right? I don't want to put any limits on how people engage with lichens, mm -hmm. but it may not be like birding um, where you can right. look at calls or you have these awesome apps that really help you identify the, the species or you can identify them by call or whatever it is. Um, but it's a different way of approaching and appreciating these things, you may be able to identify them to like a morphological group. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool, that's really powerful. Or you maybe start, start seeing patterns like, oh, these orange lichens are always under 
roosting sites of birds. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, so the way that we approach and interact with lichen diversity may be different than the way that we approach and interact with beetle diversity or bird diversity or even plant diversity. Right. Just because some of those identification tools um, are different and maybe not as accessible with traditional methods mm -hmm. with other organism groups. Does that? Yeah, kind of yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And how would you recommend people to try to get into identifying or? So the main thing, I'm going to grab this. I'm just reaching yeah. out. Um, yeah, any resources or? Um... The main thing is that I think would make it fun is where are we at here? This is a hand lens. Oh, this yep. Is a hand lens or jeweler's loop. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most enjoyable things is grab one of these, go look at a tree or go look at a rock with lichens and just start looking at those and yeah. what what's going on. And you can look at a single rock or a single tree trunk and see five or 10 different species. And then as you start looking at those, maybe you'll see those same species occurring on the same tree species of right. myself, but right. not on a different tree species. Mm. And this what, what's, what's the difference? Why would these things that I always see on this one tree not occur on a different tree? Um, but a hand lens is so much fun. Um, other things, I mean, you can use things like iNaturalist or Seek, um, and those apps are relatively decent at getting you into in the in the ballpark mm -hmm. what those 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 species are. And ballpark is pretty good with lichens, right? Yeah. And, and we, we can be okay with ballpark yeah. um, as we're as we're identifying those. Um, but I mean I think a hand lens and just looking at that different scale is really fun and a really cool way just to start yeah. saying, oh there's a whole lot more here than I initially thought. Right. That's a that's a good point. And I want to ask like how do you think art and lichen are similar? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, I've never gotten that one before. Um, I think this, I guess this isn't super specific to lichen, but I think art um, like catches your eye a lot faster than the written word. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it can draw people in a lot better than, I don't know. I know when I'm like reading academic papers about lichens, I'm like scrolling to the pictures. <laughs> like, what are the captions on the pictures? <laughs> we'll yes. about, you know, you know. Um, and I think there's a, like a, like artists have a responsibility to draw attention to issues that are important to them. Um, like like in biodiversity for example or mm -hmm. you know anything really um and I think it's it's kind of an interesting duo to have art and like and see other because art is very you know eye-catching and not always but like it's it speaks to people a lot faster than the written word does and also I think it's interesting because it's kind of this ironic duo where <laughs> lichens are a little more unassuming and you can go your whole life without noticing them. That's true. Um, and I think pairing the two is really effective because it's like, hey, look at this cute picture. Okay, also it's a lichen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're all over the place. You should go look. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's a very interesting kind of duo together. And it's been super fun to work on like, making kind of designs with like in like shapes and colors and stuff all the colors on our instagram page are taken directly from photos of lichens so that will show you a diverse range of color yeah um, what sorry what was your um your handle again for instagram oh, just so we yeah can... it's um lichens underscore irl okay got it yeah. And I'll put that in the show notes too. I also think like maybe culturally art and and certain disciplines of science serve really similar roles. Mm -hmm. uh, they indicate this, I don't know if it affluence, but it, they indicate a society that values things that may not have a direct tangible benefit relative to housing or food or reproduction. 
Um, but they do have benefits that are a little more detached or abstract, right? So when you think about the contribution of art to a society, just because it doesn't make a direct contribution to our ability to earn money or put food on the table, it doesn't mean that it's not important and that it's not fundamentally valuable for our lives. Mm. And similarly with many you know, uh, sub-disciplines in science, it's the same thing. It's indicative of a society that values something beyond those really tangible products that, that, that we com can commodify you know, in some really direct ways. Hmm. So by thinking about art and science as indicators of what a society values, um, they're hard to commodify that value, but there's a fundamental and inherent value that benefits um, cultures and peoples way beyond the specific scientific academic contribution. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's abstract, but I think, I think that, that it, it's one way of showing that, hey, that we have this culture, this society that values something that has no or very little direct um, benefit, um, but that benefit, benefit is more diffuse and more esoteric. Mm -hmm. still. Right, right. So, yeah, that is interesting. If people haven't seen Lycan before, they're, they're like alien, like out of, I don't, it's very hard to describe. They're just something that you don't really see on like an average day, especially the colors that they have, um, which is super diverse too. How do the colors um, mean anything or like how can, yeah, how do, what are the colors about? Yeah, one of the things that I know about is often orange lichens will have sunscreens, orange and okay. red, right? I, I don't know how that's super related to the color other than, oh, that might have sunscreen in it. Um, yeah. You take it away. Yeah. <laughs> So, so this is good. I mean, this goes to that. I'm sure that, that a lot of your viewers and listeners, like they've seen lichens and they can appreciate them at like a whole bunch of scales. You can look mm -hmm. at the face and see, you know, 15 different colors of lichens and appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You can go in and like look at a single lichen and appreciate how that looks. You can go and look at like the apothecia or specific structures and appreciate it at those different scales. Mm -hmm. um, but the colors, you know, if you see a green lichen, it's not green because you're seeing those algae. It's green because it's producing probably usnic acid that's mm -hmm. used for, you know, anti-herbivory and maybe in some cases as a sunscreen. If you look at an orange lichen, it's not orange because it's trying to attract pollinators. It's orange because it's, it's producing these compounds that are often used as sunscreens. Um, if you see a black lichen or a dark lichen, um, it's not dark because it's necessarily trying to be camouflage, but it's pr likely because it's producing pigments that are used for, um, again, likely sunscreens. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of those intuitive things where you think about flowers and those beautiful yeah. used to attract pollinators, um, the colors and lichens, I mean, they may be, I mean, we don't know all that much about it. So that, that may be a role, but it's more often than not that, that the utility of colors is not the same as the utility of colors and in, in okay. plants and flowers. God, it's like what it's uh, expressing or has some sort of secondary compounds or something in them. Yeah. Got it. But there, I mean, they're, uh, knowing how complex life is, I mean, there mm -hmm. must be signals where animals are looking at it and saying, oh, I'm not going to eat that. Or, hey, this right. is a place for me to hang out because nothing's going to come and graze on this. Right. Mm. Yeah. Very well, like there are specific lichens that are specifically dangerous to certain animals and things. Like there are these, everyone loves the like bright neon green wolf lichen. Um, and it's called wolf lichen because it poisons the wolves. <laughs> uh, so I feel like there must be some sort of signal a wolf sees and they're like, oh, not gonna eat that. Mm. I mean, I don't know what we'll see. Yeah. So let, let, let me give you another cool example. Um, there are these moths called lichen moths. And these moths, um, they go through and they graze on lichens and they sequester the secondary metabolites that the lichen produces. And then those moths become unpalatable to right. bats and other predators. And there's some really cool videos where they take these bats and they do palatability experiments and will take these moths that were reared um, on lichens 
and other moths that were reared on non-toxic compounds and they'll feed them to these, these bats. And it's okay. really neat to see the bat take a bite of the nasty unpalatable lichen and spit it out and you see its face of, of disgust. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to watch that. <laughs> and then they won't and then they won't eat any more of those moths. Whereas the bats that are eating the, the same moths that mm. weren't reared on lichens, they love them and they're happy to eat them. Um, so it's a, a, it, it shows that, that interconnection of life um, and that ecological view of, oh, these lichens not only are doing their thing to protect themselves, but other completely unrelated organisms are capitalizing mm. on the same features um, to have some kind of fitness advantage. And wow. Survive. Wow. What other animals uh, eat lichen? Caribou, reindeer Caribou. eat a lot of lichen. Yeah. Like, impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Snails will graze on lichens. Um, you'll often find tardigrades in lichens. Oh. Nested, nested um, not necessarily inside of them, but kind of in the crevices mm -hmm. of lichens. Um, hummingbirds use them for, for nesting materials. Squirrels use them for nesting materials. That's a good point. Um, humans have used them often for, for um, a food source. There's the Icelandic bread moss where mm. People must be really hungry to eat these because they're so gross. <laughs> but they'll they'll soak these lichens to leach out the secondary metabolites, grind them up as a supplement to mix with flour. Okay. Uh, those type of things. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of animals that eat lichens. Um, flying squirrel. Like there are a lot of of things that that eat lichens or use them for habitat mm -hmm. stuff or I don't know it's so interesting um that's kind of the side of things that I like it's like let's take something that people already care about or know about and then relate that to lichens so right yeah medications that might have lichen ingredients or people like apparently Beatrix Potter was a lichenologist oh <laughs> the Peter Rabbit author <laughs> but because it was the time that it was they're like you're willing you don't know anything and they're right. like, like dang she was right um <laughs> but like finding those those things that people already know about and care about or don't even care about but just know about mm -hmm. helps I think it helps bridge the gap between something that's totally unfamiliar to you yes. and, and yourself you know it makes it easier to have a personal connection when you're like oh my gosh reindeer eat like and that's so cool mm -hmm. I agree I'm all about bridging the gap so yeah. it's like some people like animals some people like insects whatever gets you into liking lichen yeah that'll be it um and how does one um photograph lichen how how do you capture all of the good angles to either ID or just to post like on your Instagram so um, there are some fabulous uh, lichen photographers, right? And, and I'm definitely not one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we live in, in the time when we have a lot of great tools that can facilitate decent photographs or, or good enough photographs. Mm -hmm. But profession, oh, there's, there's a book called Lichens of North America. That I have yes, a, that's the one book that I uh, really flipped through this winter. Yes, yeah. it's huge. Um, but the Sharnoffs did the photography in, in this book, and this is actually one of the books that got me into lichens initially. Me too. The Sharnoffs really uh, were in fabulous photographers, mm -hmm. where they capture the feeling and the movement in ways that that are unparalleled. So for 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 um, people looking to get into it, if you have an interest in in photography. Mm -hmm. And if you have some skills and you want to develop skills, if you can take awesome, artistic, beautiful, scientific lichen photos, I mean, that's an awesome contribution in a really cool way. Yeah. Most of the time in our lab, we'll use um, a microscope system, a dissecting scope mounted to a camera where we can take um, uh, uh, images at multiple levels and then stack those and get some pretty decent photographs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's so many skills. So, so that's what we do with some of those. Um, for for um, viewers, you guys can check out photos from like Tim Wheeler. Okay. Um, he has Tim has done some incredible lichen photography. Um, and there's not one that's in that 
National Geographic yeah. short. Yeah. yeah. That's um, so cool. And Tim's not the only one. Robert Lukeen, um, he also takes some beautiful lightning photographs and many, many others that I'm overlooking and I apologize to them. But check out Tim's photos, Robert's photos. And I think that's actually a really cool way to start to engage with lichens is mm -hmm. photographing them and thinking about them and thinking like, what do I really want to show? What are those parts mm -hmm. of the lichen that actually mean something? Yeah. Yeah, because there's like the um, different, what do you, what would you call it, um, viewpoints. So it's like far, but then near at the same time. And I was like, yeah, how do you capture like all angles without being blurry and highlighting all those points? That is kind of the skill to have. But yeah, check out check out Tim's photos and and you'll love lichens more than. than oh yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to look that up and I'll, I will post it to to uh, my podcast show notes so people can just click away at it. Um, and what are like the acidity and the basicness of like different trees that lichen can survive on? Like who picks what and how does that work? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So things like acidity um, or pH, you know, with, with um, substrate really does play a crucial role. Um, so certain tree species have different acidity, bark mm -hmm. acidity, and that determines which lichens can live on that. If you're in a geologically complex area where you may have a limestone um, erratic boulder, um, and next to it you'll have maybe a, an igneous erratic boulder, those will support two completely different lichen communities, or largely different lichen communities, and it's based on, on largely that acidity, or maybe the, the, the porousness of the rock or maybe mm. the temperature of the rock. Um, so uh, yeah, when you think about lichens, microhabitat differences are really important. And part of that is pH, part of that is, is um, texture, part of that is the ability to how much moisture can that substrate hold and for how long. Right. Um, so just because you see a lichen growing in one place, it doesn't mean that you know a meter away you'll have that same thing because those micro conditions could be wow. completely different. Wow, that's that's really incredible another, too. Sorry, and no, please. You know, that's I another know. thing about lichens is you can find one tree and find like twenty species yeah. on it. Like that's so fun. Yeah, I mean, usually you don't walk into an aspen grove and there are like twenty different trees. It's just a bunch of aspen trees, you mm -hmm. know, where yeah, it's like really easy to see a lot of lichens in one spot yeah. in a lot of areas. In, right. You know, out in nature, um, yeah. different rocks and different trees. And I don't know. I, I think that's super fun to say, like, oh my gosh, look at the diversity of lichens on this rock. Right. That's so cool. Yeah. That's we crazy. just did um, a, a bio blitz in. Um, a, a, a research natural area in southern Utah. This is a cool place called, it, it's bordering the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And we went out with a bunch of botanists to document the plant diversity and I was working on the lichen diversity. And I probably didn't move more than a quarter mile in those two days that we were doing the survey. And the botanist came back and said, oh well, yeah, we saw you know all these cool plants and they saw beautiful, awesome plants. Um, and I said, yeah, I probably found, you know, whatever, 90 or 100 different lichen species. And they were blown away that there's that much diversity. <laughs> it's like Lily says, you know, it's, you, you don't have to go very far to find a whole lot of diversity. But documenting that and understanding that, um, I think, is a, an important contribution to realizing, like, oh, these areas that we deem as important, mm -hmm. they are important but they're way different or they have things that we never would have predicted or expected, even if you're looking at it from a, a plant perspective, right? Add that right. light view and you realize like, oh, there's a whole lot more to this site than we ever would have guessed. Right. Yeah. And what, what type of research is still needed for like, and I know there's probably so much, but what are like the main focuses that you would want to continue? Yeah, so, so some of those questions are really descriptive science. And sometimes descriptive science kind of gets a, a bad rap. Everyone wants to do this really cool transformative stuff. Um, but when you don't even know what's out there, mm -hmm. documenting diversity and coming up with effective ways of characterizing that 
that's really, really important. Mm, okay. Um, but as I kind of alluded to earlier on, like even our definition of what a lichen is, is still pretty messy, mm -hmm. right? What does it mean? You know, like I talk about these co-occurring bacteria and co-occurring fungi. Are those really integral parts of a lichen or of the lichen symbiosis? Or are they just kind of like passerbys that are there? Mm -hmm. They don't play an important role. So part of that is also like, you know, fundamentally, what is a lichen? That's right. a really important question. Um, um, what it else just keeps there? getting, the yeah. what is the lichen thing just keeps getting more <laughs> convoluted. Um, I, I think what you were saying about like evolution earlier, um, I know there's some people in our lab that kind of want to go that direction of how does this evolve as a system mm -hmm. rather than just like a one plant like mm -hmm. earlier. So I think that's a really interesting avenue, at least to me. <laughs> that one's the one that I'm like, oh, I want to know about that. Um, but yeah, I agree with Stephen. Like there's so much out there that we don't even know exists. <laughs> like we know what exists, but we don't know what it is. Right. Um, so I think there's a lot of need to say look, this is, this is a lichen that produces these different things. We think it's related to this, like, you know, just doing the descriptions of these different species, I think will open the door for a lot of other research in the future um, and, and different like engagement and uses for lichens and things as we know, like what is there and what the lichens are producing and just different things. Yeah. And other cool options, I mean, for people who are interested, we need more like experimental manipulation in lichenology. Okay. So sometimes we do transplant studies if we're interested in looking at air quality or, or the impact of uh, pollution mm -hmm. or maybe the impact of climate change. And, you know, you move lichens around and document what happens to those, but also experimental manipulations in terms of, you know, what happens when we start to culture these different symbionts independently and put them together. How do they Ooh, communicate? What are they saying? Fun. We have really, really hard time even getting things to come together into something that even vaguely resembles a lichen. Mm. Right. So there's a ton of room for more experimental manipulation. I like that. Technology. And that's really fun stuff, loaded with challenges, of course. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just full of opportunity for those 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 people who are courageous enough to dive into the unknown of like, all right, let's start messing around. With yeah, these just like guessing, checking the whole yeah. time. Interesting. Um, do you think we should start using common names so people are less intimidated by lichen? Yes, <laughs> I'm yeah. gonna go full yes. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree too, right? So I mm -hmm. said there's no such thing as a lichen species. Mm -hmm. Um, Trevor Goward is a, 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 an incredible lichenologist, and he's proposed like, well, maybe with lichens, we should have official names for the lichen, and those could be the common names, mm -hmm. right? So a lichen could have a name, and it could be the wolf lichen, which is this yeah. bright, bright, bright green or yellow lichen that's fruticose. And sure, we can call that a wolf lichen, and that refers to the entire hobo biome. Got it. So we could totally be using common names. Um, and it should be used probably uh, with a different construct. And like anytime you use a common name, you're going to confuse people. It's going to be a family. Yeah. It's going to cause a little bit of stress and anxiety and, and lead people down the wrong path on occasion. Mm -hmm. It makes it accessible. It makes a connection. And then we give a lichen a name, which yeah. I think is pretty important. And I, I feel like the common names are also pretty descriptive. <laughs> like the pixie cap lichen, you can picture like a little... Yeah. Pixie coming and drinking out of the lichen <laughs> brooding body. Um, yeah. And, or like a lettuce lichen definitely looks like a lettuce leaf. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, I feel like it's really a lot easier to remember the common names, at least for me. Because right. I, like, I don't, that, that is two really long words that don't mean anything to me. Right. It's just the species name. Um, but if someone says, oh, um, it's a lace like and I'm like, oh, I know exactly what that looks like, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, the, one of the problems is I think with with science is we create these artificial boundaries, right? Like if you're using common names, you're in that other group, mm -hmm. right? 
you know, if you want to be a real lichenologist, you should be using like the scientific names. Right. I think those those distinctions or that 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 way of dealing with it is is moronic and limiting, and it really is counterproductive to what we're trying to pursue in, in terms of how we understand life on Earth. Right. So, so big picture, if somebody's happy to learn the scientific names and if that's fun for them, awesome, go at it and and enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, and if if you you know somebody else wants to to understand these like focusing on the common names, great. There's tons of information you can get from that as well. And it's not that one is superior than the other, but there are mm -hmm. different approaches to try to engage with this in meaningful ways. So I mean, I think we try to have this like unintentionally we end up having this elitism in science yep. that's productive to actually like promoting what we want to do, and that's yeah. understanding life around. Right. That's that's exactly why I was asking that question I I think you put that perfectly I don't want to intimidate people I'm not good at Latin I barely know uh, I know I had to memorize some stuff for a class but um, I don't know many <laughs> scientific names to stuff and it's hard to even communicate that to people if they are not on the same page so it's kind of like oh we all know what a begonia is or something like that or a daisy um, so that's easier to get people interested. And I feel like we need to do that with lichen because people are, are just like, oh, it's a scientific name. I'm never going to know what it is. <laughs> and they're just already shut down. Yeah, I so. agree. I feel like one of the big struggles of trying to do outreach for, for the lab here is like taking something that feels very like, I don't know, academic and, and yeah, very right. scientific and very, yeah, very, very focused mm -hmm. on some tiny aspect of lichens and make that appealing to a broader audience of people who among them are like a lot of lichenologists that are like, oh yeah, I read that study or whatever. But then they're also like, <laughs> like my cousin has gotten really into lichens because she's like, oh my gosh, look at all these cool facts that I know about lichens now. And mm -hmm. I know kind of what kind of research is going on because I, I feel like 50% of my job is like taking all the scientific jargon and like making it like layman's speech. Yeah. Um, and I think that really opens the door for people to say, um, wow, I'm, I, I'm not so overwhelmed by this. So I want to keep learning about it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's super important. Um, because yeah, it's it is kind of this weird, ironic thing where it's like we want people to appreciate these organisms, but we're going to be really elitist about it. Yes, like, we're going to be very, um, I don't know, like not make it accessible to anyone. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of weird to me. I'm like, wait. I want people to care about what you're doing. Exactly. But that really is like, I think one of the biggest challenges and it's, it's I'm sure it's not only for lichenology. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but, but that that really is like our big challenges is, is as lichenologists, we love what we do. Um, it's a great community of scientists worldwide. It's not huge, but but we're passionate about these, these little things, yeah. but it becomes really, really isolated. And we talk to people like, oh, let me tell you what a lichen is and we start going off on like this 10 minute explanation of like okay. we don't really know what a lichen is we don't have the best definition yet and they're turned off after 30 seconds yep. like um so so it's just that weird thing where where somebody becomes we i become so passionate about something that i lose the ability mm. to communicate with a broader group like oh this is cool because whatever it makes a connection with me and a place and a time yep and yeah, that's a challenge you face. Yeah. I think if you had asked me what a lichen was, I would have been like, oh, it's these two partners and a couple other organisms usually, and it's symbiotic, you yeah. know? Right. <laughs> Steven's like, it's this giant thing. <laughs> but it also like not. Specific but... things, which is, it's fun to know, but mm -hmm. I think there are like different levels. Of, that's a good point yeah any, any level that somebody wants to engage with it that is legit that's cool that's worth pursuing it's not that you have to level up to the next level to be like yeah a legitimate have legitimate interest in lichens you know choose a level that's cool to you mm -hmm. that's, that 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 engages with you and that's that's as good as any other level mm -hmm. i agree 
how how can somebody like collect these to ID them later? And what kind of tools can you use to ID? Yeah, um, identification can become challenging, right? So traditionally, if you uh, photographs often aren't enough. Mm -hmm. if you want an accurate species level identification, photographs aren't enough. Um, but at the same time, if you just want to get it into like a morpho group, a, a photograph is totally fine. But if you have permits or if you're not causing damage, you can go out with a hammer and chisel and collect small, you know, uh, specimens that you can bring back to a lab or you can take a collecting knife and take a piece of bark off a tree. Again, follow local permits and, and regulations. Mm -hmm. of <laughs> and then you can take those back to a lab and use things like a dissecting scope and, and you could probably track down affordable dissecting scopes or even affordable compound microscopes if you're really into it. Mm -hmm. Start working on sectioning. Um, I mentioned Tim Wheeler and his photographs. Um, he has his own personal collection that's probably close to 20,000 or more specimens now, where he's just gone out and, and collected all of these specimens. He's collected, you know, included all this, you know, fundamental information, including the date, the location, the substrate. Um, whatever it takes to have a legitimate scientific voucher specimen. Mm -hmm. And then he has them and you can go through and do thin layer chromatography or look at them under a dissecting scope or section these apothecia. Um, but you don't have to do that. I mean, photographs can work too and get you into that right group and you can say, hey, this is a shield lichen or this is a beard lichen okay. or this is um, um, you know, a cobblestone lichen, whatever it is. And that's totally legit too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because there's like chemicals you can use and like UV to ID stuff. What what's the lichen with like UV? Is yeah, that... so, so a lot of these lichens they'll they'll fluoresce under under UV light in different ways. And again, it's based on those secondary metabolites. Got it. Okay. But you can do things that are even simpler. Get a black light and go out at night, and even with a black light, shine it on trees. They'll they'll reflect that in different ways. And you can see some really cool, fascinating lichens, um, just the black light at night um, in some places. Wow, that is really cool. I'll have to, I want to go out at night and actually like look at stuff because I feel like I walk around in the daytime, but doing the same kind of walk, but at night yeah. would be interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think you talked about some like everyday lichen items, um, like um, what were we talking about before, like the sunscreen or stuff like that? What kind of, what other things do people use lichen for in like every day? Perfumes, right? Perfumes. So Perfumes, yeah. dyes, dyes, food. Mm -hmm. um, let me look. <laughs> De deodorant. Oh yeah, it's in a lot of oh. natural deodorants. A lot of natural deodorants. And what are these names that they are using? I bet they're not just saying lichen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oftentimes they do just say like oh really <laughs> yeah um, so there's a genus of lichen forming fungi called avernia um avernia pronastri is often used for the perfumes mm, okay um you can use things like uh, tumbleweed lichens for dyes there's uh, a different umbilicarias and rose anyway so there's a, a bunch of different species that produce really specific colors when you're dyeing yarn and oh, okay. That would be a, a really cool podcast is talk to somebody who knows a lot about um, dyeing with, with, with dyeing yarn with lichens. Oh, that's a that's fascinating a yeah. topic. I'll have um, to look that up. But oftentimes they do, they just call them lichens. If okay. It's a, if it's a lichen curry, they'll just call it a lichen curry um, and they won't identify which mm. spe species it is. But they will use only specific lichens because other ones are unpalatable. Mm. But right. in terms of marketing, it's like in this or like in that. Got it, got it. And how do you think flora and fungi as like a whole can influence the future? I, I, think, I think it's fundamental, right? I mean, we, we know that, that um, and I don't mean this to sound derogatory, but we know that there's plant blindness. People don't think about and consider plants and fungi the same way they consider um, um, other animals or, mm -hmm. animals or other life. So anything that we can do to help realize and make a connection to the fact like, oh, there's way more going on even in, in, in our neighborhood or in our community than I ever thought 
is foundational to making those connections that Lily mentioned at the beginning. So again, I think this is what we want to do if we're interested, not only knowing and understanding life around us, but protecting, conserving, making a more resilient planet and maybe hopefully trying to counteract um, our, our own current destructive habits and practices, we have to appreciate what's around us. And that's kind of the floor and fungal perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, and then, yeah, how can people get involved with that and do something? I think mean, just recognizing like kittens and see like, whoa, that's so cool. And maybe pointing them out to their friends, like, hey, do you know about this? Mm. Um, just like, <laughs> I feel like when I say I study likings, people are like, what? Like, <laughs> it kind of looks like moss, it's on rocks. And they're like, oh yeah. That stuff. But also it, it's not moss and it's not just on rocks. And it doesn't always look like moss. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> It's, it, I think, just like a general awareness of, you know, what are lichens? What can they do? What do they look like? You know, how are they contributing to just different, like, <laughs> on the Instagram page, like, I feel like there's such a range of what, like, lichens have contributed to from, like, home craft, like, dine yarn, to food, to like assessing environmental justice <laughs> like it's there's such a range of, of subjects that lichens are involved yeah. in yeah um so I think it's I I feel like anyone if they spend a little bit of time can kind of find their niche you know mm. um I mean for me it's definitely like what animals eat lichens <laughs> um I love that one um, but people, I feel like there's something to, to, um, that like everyone can appreciate about lichens or yeah. like everyone has something that they can appreciate about lichens. Yeah. There's a lichen out there for everyone. I love that. I love yes. That. 100%. <laughs> uh, don't you have a link on, on, on something like that? Like, um, which lichen is most like you or something? We had a quiz. We yeah. had a, a quiz that people could do to identify which lichen they were. But <laughs> I, it's interesting as somebody who just inherently, I think I just always have been fascinated by plants. Mm -hmm. and, right. So it's just, I don't know why that is. I don't know why I like them. Um, but not everybody's that way. And I like this idea that there's a lichen for everyone, but I don't know if that's true. Yeah. Some people might not even care and ever care about them. That's true. Like the fact that, like, I think they're the coolest thing in the world. Um, but I, I, I have no idea how that all shakes out. I have no idea why some people care more about plants and fungi than others. And mm -hmm. I'm glad I do, I guess. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad there's people out there like you too. And that's why I'm doing this. Yeah, I love it. It's great. Yeah, I think regardless of, I still stand by the statement that there's a like in front of me. <laughs> but <laughs> I think regardless of like how enthusiastic people are about it, just making them aware that this is a thing. Like, mm -hmm. like you, Stephen said earlier, like once you see lichen, you can't stop. You yeah. just see them everywhere, you know? And and if you don't know what they are, it's kind of like, yeah, whatever. Like, that's just a thing on a tree or yeah. whatever. Lichen um, blind, blindness. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah. And then when you do know what it is, it's like, oh yeah, I know what that is. And that's, I don't know, I feel like, even if you're not like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna like research lichens and like find my favorite one, mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever. Um, at least I think awareness is a really big part of just like preserving the world. <laughs> yeah. uh, to be aware, like this is an organism and it's cool and it exists. And you don't have to appreciate it necessarily, but if you know about it, that's one more person that knows what a lichen is. Definitely. And that thing has as much evolutionary time behind it as, as we have, right? And, you know, discounting that it's, you know, not important because it doesn't look like us mm -hmm. is crazy, right? I mean, these things have it, the exact same amount of evolutionary time behind it that we have, and discounting them as un unimportant seems to be trivializing some pretty fundamentally important things or processes that have happened on earth. Mm -hmm. Agreed. 
And I want to ask both of you, um, what is your favorite, do you have a favorite lichen and um, do you have a favorite lichen fact? Um, my favorite lichen is the sea fog lichen. Let me look up the scientific name real quick. Um, I have featured it twice as lichen of the week, which I don't do very often. The scientific <laughs> name is Nibla. I oh, don't know. No. You say it. Sea fog. It's a sea fog lichen. Yeah. We're going to keep it. It's a, it's yeah. In the, yeah. I like yeah. that. No, it's, yeah, in it's the too hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then my favorite lichen, in fact, is just the caribou lichen. I, I, like really, I think that one's so cute. <laughs> yeah, I should have, I don't have a favorite lichen. That's awesome too. I, I, I it's like saying you have a favorite child or something. I could Of the time. <laughs> yeah. But, but a favorite lichen in fact is that they're symbiotic phenotypes. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a neat way of seeing the world is, is it's an emergent property from this interaction of unlike groups. And th these things are symbiotic phenotypes. And I love that. I mean, it's just crazy. Really, yeah. Emergent properties are really fascinating. I, I do love that. I've been, since that book too, I was like, oh, lichen are so weird, so cool. Just like super unique and not a lot of people are studying it, I feel. So that's something I'm like, oh, maybe I could get into that because I like the connections of plants and fungi. And this is kind of like up that alley a bit. Um, so do you have any other resources that you would recommend if people are trying to get into lichens? So some resources I think that could be helpful. There's uh, the American Bryological and Lichenological Society. Okay. Um, and especially for students or people who kind of want to maybe start looking at it, you know, um, uh, maybe from an academic or a student perspective, uh, there's awesome support there. It's a great community in terms of a bunch of great scientists, a bunch of awesome students, mm -hmm. all with kind of similar interests. So I'd look into that if you're in, largely in, in, in North America. There's the International Association for Lichenologists. Um, and again, great people, um, a great community. I'd also take a look at um, Trevor Goward's webpage, Ways of Enlightenment. Okay. <laughs> yeah. one. If you just want to like browse mm -hmm. pictures of lichen and like little descriptions and stuff, it's really fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jason Hollinger has a bunch of beautiful pictures on that um, that yeah. are worth looking at. There's some essays on what lichens are. Um, oh boy. That may be, may be um, worth looking into for some people. Mm -hmm. um, but again, get a hand lens, go out there if you're interested in kind of pursuing it from a, a, a uh, I guess a more formal perspective, look into the American Biological and Lichenological Society. Okay. Um, but yeah, lots of lots of good stuff. Have fun yeah. with it. Don't take yourselves too serious. Right. With That's the rule, right? Just have yeah. fun. <laughs> I have, there are a couple things that I look at it a lot. And one of them is just the Wikipedia page for lichen. Mm -hmm. um, there's just like a ton of information, you know, and you can dig deeper if you want to. Oh, um, yeah. Um, which I love. Um, and then I think there are a couple of videos with a lichenologist named Manuela Del Forno, mm -hmm. and they're really good introductions to like it. Okay. I mean, they're like four kids, but like they're super yeah. interesting, yeah. good Just information. So I don't care. <laughs> Perfect. And Manuela Del, Del Forno, she is at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, BRIT. So okay. if you want to look that up. Um, yeah. And videos. didn't she used to work for like the national Smithsonian for a while? Yeah. yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. So she's she's pretty prominent. Awesome. Yeah, we got some good resources. I have to uh, look some of this stuff up and get more into it. Um, yeah, thank you both for coming on my podcast and thanks for working all of this out with me. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention or something that I didn't ask? No, thank you. This is this is great. What you're mm -hmm. doing, the contribution is, is worthwhile. Thanks for inviting us on. Yeah, yeah thank you. I always love talking about like it. Yes, perfect. <laughs> no, no, I love it. Can, but mm -hmm. no, I like the combination <laughs> of people. Again, I just want to get everybody into it, no matter kind of what avenue it is. So, um, yeah, thank you again. And I like your shirt. It actually matches my like 
yeah. back here. It's like the same art. Oh, I like that. Matching. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we planned it. <laughs> just kidding. All right. Well, um, yeah, I think I have everything. And thank you again for this opportunity. Hey, nice talking with you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Bye. See ya. Bye.